We are all the same. And yet, all different. But are we really that unique? How we are born. How we grow. How we live. How we love. and how we die. This is the evolutionary tale of animals and humans. The secrets of our form, our extraordinary behaviors. That tell the story of us. every imaginable environment. New life waits to be born. No matter how different, within each individual burns the same overwhelming drive. A quest for genetic immortality. But the task ahead is formidable. They must survive, grow and reproduce in a harsh and unwelcoming wilderness. And for many animals, life is brutal and short. newborn sea turtles, there's only safety in numbers. But born in the daylight with a hundred vulnerable brothers and sisters, it's really no safety at all. It's a race to the sea. One by one, the winners are snapped up. If fortune somehow favours this little turtle, he'll be the one in a thousand that survives to pass on his DNA. It seems like impossible odds. Yet each year the beach is inundated with survivors who are returning to lay their eggs. It's a reproductive strategy that's worked for the sea turtle for more than 100 million years. At the ends of the earth, a flock of emperor penguins executes an entirely different reproductive strategy. With their backs to the bitter Antarctic winds, the expectant fathers devote all their attention to the survival of a single egg. They won't eat for months, living off their body fat, while their partners hunt at sea. When the females finally return, sleek and fat and ready for their shift, the males are starving. But it's a reluctant handover. For all the parents' dedication, their hardest road lies ahead. 
chick is finally born, but its chance of surviving the season is only 50%. And half of those left will die while they're still fledglings. For most emperor couples, all that sacrifice will be in vain. But far away from the wilderness, in an air-conditioned, sterilised theatre, a very different animal is about to be born. The labour is long and painful. There's no predator in sight, but the risks are high. Multiple assistants are required. much collaborative effort. Just one helpless infant emerges. She'll need intensive nurturing for many years to come. Taxing the resources of her parents and limiting their ability to produce more offspring. But her prospects of survival are phenomenally good. This baby is almost guaranteed to reach sexual maturity. An anomaly in the animal kingdom. She belongs to a species that's so intelligent and physically well adapted, it's managed to dominate almost every other species on Earth. Which raises the question, why is such a successful animal so helpless at birth? There are so many more capable infants, like the African zebra. After an entire year in the womb, the foal enters its new world with remarkable swiftness. The labour takes just eight minutes. Almost immediately, the youngster is rising to stand. After around 10 minutes, it's on its feet. And in an hour, it's running with the herd. Even animals born more needy reach independence at a rapid rate. But the human baby's progress is incredibly slow. for young Vivian to lift up her head. Another two months to gain the coordination to roll over onto her stomach. And at just seven months of age, she can now sit up all by herself. It's going to take almost double that amount of time before she takes her first unaided steps. It's one of the great paradoxes in nature because the reason we're so dependent at birth turns out to be the reason we're so smart. The human brain. Primates are known for having big brains relative to body size. That means they have heads that are close to the size of the birth canal through which they're born. Orangutans, chimps and gorillas have bigger bodies and more spacious birth canals. But monkeys, gibbons and humans have a cranium that just barely squeezes through. This means the human head can only grow so big before it gets stuck. It could help explain why our babies emerge while still relatively underdeveloped with a brain around 27% of its adult size. But growing a baby with such a big brain is also a massive energy drain on the mother. 
and by nine months she may well have reached the limits of her metabolic capacity. It's another theory behind our early emergence from the womb. Whichever the case, it appears that humans started walking around the same stage of brain development as other mammals. Because those animals are born further along the track, they're able to scramble to their feet almost immediately. The human brain is considered the crowning achievement of our evolution. Credited for placing us at the apex of the animal kingdom and allowing us to exploit all manner of environments from the poles to the equator. For giving us a love of travel, culture and language. For making us special. But is the human brain really so outstanding? When it comes to sheer size, the sperm whale has the largest brain on Earth, weighing in at eight kilograms. Whales are known for having complex social lives and behaviors. They can recognize individuals and family members despite long periods of separation. Famous for their songs, they have regional dialects just like us. Humans don't have the biggest brain surface area either. On this measure, we're beaten by the dolphin which has incredibly complex brain folds. And the African elephant, owner of the largest brain on land, has triple the neurons we do. To cope with such a large, heavy head, the skull has a honeycomb structure full of air spaces, making it both light and strong. Their calves, able to walk on the day they're born, spend almost two full years developing inside the womb. But as clever as they may be, elephants don't beat humans in intelligence tests. Brain size compared to body mass could be considered a better indicator of intelligence. But even this produces an unlikely winner. The humble tree shrew has the greatest brain to body mass ratio of any mammal. It looks like a large mouse but they're more closely related to primates than rodents. Still, no one rates them as intellectual giants. Because we can't seem to win on any scale, scientists have invented the encephalization quotient. This gives a number based on the size of brain that's expected for body type and size. On this, humans are the clear winner with a brain 7.5 times the size expected. We finally found a way for our brains to be exceptional. But do brains need to be big to be extraordinary? The honeybee with her sesame seed sized mind must find and locate nectar and avoid crashing into things in a variety of weather conditions. She must make complex turns, takeoffs, and landings, while understanding conceptual relationships like same, different, above, and below. But that's not all. When she gets back to the hive, she communicates the best food location through a special dance. It has two phases, the waggle and the return. The longer she waggles, the further away the flowers are, and the angle that she dances across the honeycomb tells the others which way to go in relation to the sun. All this with only a million neurons. 
while we have 86 billion. Some creatures get by remarkably well with no brain at all. And all of them live underwater. Like the crown of thorns starfish. It's a fearsome predator that sucks the colour and life out of tropical reefs. Instead of a head, it's crowned by an anus. Each arm has numerous feet, which it also uses to breathe through. With many unappealing attributes, the starfish still manages to reproduce in great numbers. At plague proportions, it destroys vast regions of coral. And even without a brain, the starfish can recognise a threat and display fear running for its life from its most voracious predator, the great triton sea snail. Sometimes brains can be arranged in remarkable ways for unusual talents. The octopus has what could be considered nine brains. With a central nervous system in the head and processing units in each arm. That enables each arm to taste, touch and move as if it were an individual. but they can also be directed by the master commander brain to work together to solve problems. Like finding a suitable home. what makes them master escape artists and notoriously difficult to keep in an enclosure. And when the game is up, a smart animal knows it. Across all its processing units, the octopus has around the same amount of neurons as a dog. But how does the arrangement of those neurons make all the difference? Just like all other vertebrate mammals, dogs have one central brain. Their cleverness resides in a section called the cerebral cortex. It's the thin, wobbly rind at the outer edges of the brain. While different regions process stimuli like smell, touch and vision, it's the cerebral cortex that makes sense of it all. One of the key measures of intelligence is how many neurons are packed in here. And in this region of the brain, humans have a huge margin on dogs with around 16 billion neurons. Animals with more neurons in the cerebral cortex not only display more intelligence, they also tend to live longer and take longer to mature. It may help explain why we're the longest living of all the apes and why our babies remain dependent for so long. A big and complex brain reaps many rewards, but also comes at a tremendous cost. 
and nature's currency is energy. The sun is the main source of all the world's energy. Through photosynthesis, it drives chemical reactions up through the food chain and fuels the functions of every animal. It gives them the power to grow, eat, move, mate, and above all, to think. Feeding a big brain can be incredibly taxing because brain tissue requires more than 20 times the energy of muscle. When winter comes, the big brain shrew is in trouble. It needs to eat every few hours just to sustain life. And there's slim pickings, even when all you want is a good juicy tick. But the shrew has evolved an extraordinary trick. In the cold season, its brain shrinks, which may substantially reduce its energy needs. It's not just a marginal drop. The shrew's brain decreases by around 25% across the winter months, and their spine and organs also shrink. When spring returns, the shrew beefs up once more, just in time to find a mate and die. Without any brain shrinking tricks, eating is a full-time job for the African elephant. It can take up to 18 hours of the day just to find enough food to supply the energy needs for its massive body and brain. On a diet of roots, bushes, bark, fruit and grasses, it can consume more than 130 kilograms of vegetation in a single day. With all that time spent eating, it's lucky the elephant is also the world's shortest sleeping mammal. In the wild, they get by with as little as two hours of shut-eye a night. Early humans were thought to have grazed on a varied diet, much like chimpanzees. Mainly plant matter with a bit of meat. But even chimps chomp away for around eight hours a day. Yet somehow, in the last three million years, our ancestors' brains found enough extra energy to triple in size, catapulting humans into a class of their own. The big question is, what exactly happened? What changes could have fueled such incredible growth? The traditional view is that we joined the world of carnivores and began eating meat. It's no game for the weak, but the reward for a kill is high. Pound for pound, meat delivers much more energy than a vegetarian diet. In the grasslands, Australia's largest bird of prey has spotted lunch. The wedge-tailed eagle will eat almost anything it can get its giant talons on. And today, it's a feral rabbit. As a single meal, this small mammal can offer the equivalent calories to several kilos of grass. With each twist and turn, the rabbit evades death. but a pause to catch breath ends up being its last.
carnivores tend to have a recognisable set of features. Like forward-facing eyes, ideal for gauging depth. Built for strength and speed, they're masters of the short distance kill. With claws and teeth to tear and shred, many carnivores also have a crushing bite. The saltwater crocodile has the most powerful known bite, crunching down at 16,000 newtons, nearly two tons. Unable to chew, they clench and roll, drowning their prey and tearing it limb from limb. Every single croc species can bite down at tremendous force for its size which lies at the heart of why they've been such an evolutionary success, dominating their ecological niche for 85 million years. Their bite force is more than three times that of the hyena, which can bring down a wildebeest and tear it apart. By contrast, the human jaw can rip into a stake at a relatively pathetic 890 newtons. Without the talons and teeth of the carnivore, how did we transform to big game killers? Perhaps we began as scavengers. But the evidence suggests early humans began to butcher animals just before their brains grew. However it happened, meat was almost certainly on the menu. But eating more meat is not the end of the human story. It's not the dietary distinction that separates us from the rest of the pack there's another culinary skill we've acquired along the way, which no animal on Earth has yet mastered. It may have been key to the arrival of our big brains. We tamed fire and learnt to cook. Fire is an innovation that has dramatically changed the human energy equation. It provides heat, light, and the ability to remain social into the night. With fire, we can sleep out in the open and remain warm. The village fire of the Himba, a hunter-gatherer tribe in Namibia, is never allowed to go out. It's seen as a bridge between the living and the dead and the source of prosperity and health. The Himba also use fire to cook like every other society on Earth. Across the entire world, there's no human group that eats all of their food raw. No matter the taste buds or the culture, cooking is the signature feature of the human diet. Cooking makes eating faster, easier and more digestible. It breaks down the connective tissues in meat and softens the cell walls of plants. It allows access to more calories in less time. All helping fuel our hungry brains. Until recently, it wasn't considered that cooking might be important to the evolution of our brain size. After all, most foods that can be cooked can also be eaten raw. But experiments suggest that a raw food diet simply doesn't supply enough energy for humans. Not only do they become underweight, but around half of the females stop ovulating, a disastrous direction for the fertility of our species. Through processing and cooking, humans have harvested so much energy that we're now not just the brainy ape, but also the fat ape. 
threatening the very longevity we've acquired from being so smart. Whether or not we mastered fire before we evolved big brains is controversial. But by the time bigger brains evolved, we had already found other ways to save considerable amounts of energy, starting with the way we moved. Getting about on two legs isn't unique to humans. Bipedalism has evolved many times in nature. Kangaroos are the only large animals that hop, with an energy efficient spring that allows them to cover great distances. Many lizards switch to two legs for a rapid escape, and all birds get about on two legs at least some of the time. But the way each animal walks is different. Birds walk on their toes rather than their entire foot. And like most bipedal animals, they walk with their back sloping and their knees bent. When other apes are on two legs, their knees bend at almost 90 degrees. And this makes walking tiring. They prefer to knuckle walk. It's a surprisingly fast gait, but compared to the human walk, it's still inefficient. We use around a quarter of the energy of a chimp, thanks to longer legs and a differently shaped spine and pelvis. In mid-stride, the angle of the human knee is almost straight, at around 170 degrees. Learning to walk upright has given humans a very important bonus. It freed the hands, opening up a new world of possibilities that refined and developed the fine motor skills of those big brains. On two legs, we could travel long distances and navigate the great continents of the world. On two legs, we could run. But how did we become one of the best in the animal kingdom? If it's speed you're after, it's impossible to look past the cheetah, the world's fastest land animal. It's been clocked at speeds too fast for many of the world's freeways at over 120 kilometres an hour. It's no coincidence that it also has the longest and most flexible spine of any feline. It's also the only big cat with a forearm the same length as the upper arm. Both features allow the cheetah to lengthen its stride and launch into each extension with maximum spring. At top speed, it can leap around seven metres with each stride, remaining airborne for more than half the time. With light slender bones and paws, the cheetah can pick up its pace to an incredible three and a half strides a second. Underwater, the champion of speed is the sailfish, which can dart through the water at an extraordinary 30 metres a second. They maximise their agility and speed in a pack, using their spectacular dorsal fins to fence in prey. They twist and turn so fast 
They've evolved special tissues to heat up their eyeball nerves, allowing them to view their game with lightning precision. But no living creature on land or in the sea can come close to the speeds of a peregrine falcon. It's somewhat of a cheat, using gravity to hurtle towards prey like an asteroid. Burning through the skies at 58 metres a second. That's an astonishing 390 kilometres an hour. But where does that leave humans? When it comes to speed, we barely get off the starting blocks before the race is over. With a record sprint speed of just 44 kilometres an hour, even the fastest man alive is unimpressive in the animal kingdom. But we're like the proverbial tortoise. Slow and steady wins the race. On a hot day over a long distance, there's almost no land mammal on Earth that can beat us. Because we lack speed, running has often been overlooked as an important factor in human evolution. But it may have been key to joining the realm of carnivores, finding a way to drive prey into hypothermia on a hot day. But to become one of the world's best long-distance runners on the hot, open plains of Africa, we needed ways to dump heat fast. First, we needed to ditch that hot, furry coat. Hair is unique to mammals, and most have a lot of it. It provides key benefits for survival, like warmth and protection from bites, scratches and the harmful rays of the sun. For prey and predator alike, it's a good way to hide while in plain sight. The fur of the Bengal tiger is marked with stripes that break up the outline of its shape making it difficult to detect in light and shade. Spots create a similar disruption. Even the dramatic coat of the zebra, which seems like a standout to us, has a confounding effect on a very different set of eyes. The compound eyes of flies. As horseflies zoom in to bite, their eyes can't judge the landing distance and they fail to decelerate in time, bouncing off the coat. Escaping predators that spread disease can be just as important as evading those with a bigger bite. Camouflage is such a useful attribute that nature has evolved the trick over and over in coverings from feathers to scales. The owl butterfly is known for its huge wing spots that mimic the eyes of an owl, discouraging other avian predators. Owls themselves can be much harder to spot. Sometimes a fur coat can match both the environment and the season. It's summertime and the Arctic fox family is a beautiful match to its rocky surrounds. Come winter, their coats go through a dramatic transformation. The most obvious change is the colour 
which makes it hard to spot against the snow. But incredibly, it's also changed its structure. Because it lacks pigment, each white hair is now hollow. And this allows it to trap more air than solid hair, making the coat much warmer. A white coat can be around 30% more insulating than a brown one. It's what makes animals like the polar bear able to tolerate extraordinarily cold air temperatures. But the polar bear is only white when it comes to its fur. Underneath, its skin is black, which helps the bear absorb as much of the sun's warmth as possible, while retaining it in those hollow hairs. On evolutionary terms, both polar bears and sea otters are relative newcomers to the marine environment. But while a polar bear spends a lot of time on the ice, the Californian sea otter hardly ever comes to shore. It rests, berths, mates and feeds in some very cold waters. Lacking blubber, the otter compensates with the thickest fur coat on Earth. Their superfine coats carry up to a million hairs per square inch. They lock together with tiny barbs to form a waterproof outer shell that traps air in the fine underdown. Acting like a furry dry suit. That's why otters spend so much time grooming themselves. But with such a luxurious warm coat comes the problem of overheating. Animals that need to travel long distances across the hot open savanna face the same problem to a much greater degree. Especially those with bigger bodies like the African elephant. With a relatively smaller surface area to its large volume, getting rid of excess heat can be a challenge. But they have a brilliant adaptation. Gigantic ears, covered in vessels, providing a huge extra surface area. By increasing blood flow to the ears and flapping them, elephants can effectively dissipate some of their body heat. When temperatures get too hot, they need access to water. Their sensitive trunk can detect a water hole several kilometres away. Here, their wonderfully adapted bodies have another advantage. Wrinkles. Their folds and sags are excellent at trapping moisture, helping them to cool down. It's another good reason for wallowing in the mud for hours. For those that have fur and don't fancy the mud, panting is the main trick for staying cool. Panting cools the blood through the evaporation of water in the mouth and airways, which have lots of blood vessels. But panting has its limitations. Running fast requires deep breaths for a good oxygen supply. It's one of the reasons animals can't run long distances while they're hot, because they can't pant and run. But humans don't pant 
or have big ears. So what's our great secret to dumping heat fast? We sweat bucket loads of water, literally. Humans can squeeze out an astonishing 12 litres of water a day through sweat. As the water evaporates from the skin, it carries heat away with it. Many other animals can sweat, but it's a sticky mix of proteins, lipids and hormones which sits on top of their fur. It's not a great way of cooling, and even horses which work themselves into a lather of sweat will eventually collapse from heat exhaustion if forced to keep running on a hot day. But humans sweat 99% water. Instead of being associated with hair, the ducts lie on the outermost layer of skin and release their fluid through tiny pores. We're covered in millions of them. And because the water sits on the skin, cooling is much more effective. It's the main reason why humans can keep going while others give up. And it's key to how we became one of the great runners in the animal kingdom. You can tell a lot about what kind of movement an animal is good at by looking at its muscle composition. Skeletal muscles can generally be divided into two types. Fast twitch, which contract quickly and provide powerful bursts of strength. And slow twitch, which use oxygen to produce energy and can last much longer. Chimps consist mainly of fast twitch muscle, which explains their short bursts of great strength. There is a third type of muscle, fast twitch muscle fibres that can use oxygen. These can provide both extremely rapid and sustained muscle contractions. It's this type of muscle fibre that allows the hummingbird to do what no other bird can do. Hover. By hovering, this hummingbird can access sugars in the most delicate flowers, normally reserved for insects. But these fast twitch muscles are also incredibly energy expensive. Despite being one of the tiniest birds on the planet, no animal on Earth has a faster metabolism. Their hearts can beat at more than 1,000 times a minute to sustain around 50 wing beats a second. They burn energy so fast, they can eat up to three times their body weight in nectar per day. Luckily, we don't have that problem. Humans are mainly slow twitch muscle, low on power, but big on endurance. And we developed other key adaptations to help us run, including a new ligament, joining the back of the skull to the top vertebrae. With this attachment, our shoulders can swing free while our big head stays steady. Our forearms shortened with no need to drag them on the ground. At the back of our foot, the long Achilles tendon, which is barely visible in other apes, thickened and swelled to be the largest of any primate, playing a key role in storing and releasing energy as we run. Which brings us down to one of the most overlooked evolutionary adaptations in the human body, the foot. Most mammals, like dogs and cats, run around on the balls of their feet. 
horses are the only animals on Earth that run on one toe. It's an adaptation which gave them greater resistance to bone stress and helps them move faster. But when humans run barefoot, it's a flat landing. With each push off the ground, the foot withstands forces much greater than the entire body weight, yet barely bends. That's thanks to the two main arches of the foot, which run both across the foot and lengthways. They give the human foot both stiffness and flexibility, acting like a lever and a spring. Such stiff feet are unique among primates. Their feet go all bendy in the middle and are much more suited to gripping tree branches. Humans may not be able to claim the title of world's fastest runner, or even biggest brain. We may not have the fiercest bite or the strongest arms. But somehow our unique combination of evolutionary adaptations has pushed our species to the forefront of the world's most important race. To survive and reproduce. From Africa to the North Pole and across the Great Seas, human populations have exploded. Our success is more than just anatomy. Our unique traits and habits truly set us apart. And that's the other half of the story of the human animal.